So hi guys, I'm, I'm Eli, PGY4. We're gonna jump right into our EM controversies debate on protocols. Um, thanks to the team and obviously to Kenny for debating this with me today. We wanted to take a second and specifically define what a protocol is. And the reason being that it's actually really conflated in literature and in conversation what a policy, a protocol, a guideline, a procedure is. So for the purposes of this debate, think of a protocol as nestled inside of a policy. A policy is a framework. It's an overarching rule or law that the institution would like to see to. And a protocol is the specific mandated set of instructions that are required in order to fulfill that policy. So a policy is broad, a protocol is specific. There are different types of policies and there's different types of protocols. And uh, the two main protocols are diagnostic uh, and therapeutic. So think of a diagnostic protocol as a specific set of labs or imaging that must be ordered for a certain criteria or, or diagnosis. And a therapeutic protocol as being a certain, a certain set of treatments must be ordered, whether that's antibiotics, antipyretics, um, or, or pain medication. Uh, one way to think about this in terms of maybe something we're more familiar with is post-cardiac arrest care. So there is an institutional guideline for post-cardiac arrest care. There is a policy on targeted temperature management or cooling for certain cardiac arrest patients. And there's a protocol for how we do what uh, when we decide we do want to cool somebody. Who puts a central line in? Where do we put the central line in? What temperature do we do we cool to? And then the procedure is, you know, the procedures that we specifically do, like a central line or a Foley insertion, or the cooling that nursing can follow. So onto my argument of, of pro protocol, and Kenny will argue the opposite. As a reminder, this is a debate for uh, academics. This is not necessarily the viewpoint that each of us holds. Uh, so I'll go over the overall case, some real world examples of protocols, a few specific protocols, uh, and then, then conclude it with some trauma, some trauma data. So overall, the argument for protocols revolves around an increase in flow for the department, whether that being length of stay or provider to disposition, and improving time to treatment for patients uh, of those therapeutic protocols that I was talking about, and that it can improve patient safety as well. We are not the only field that has protocols in place, and we shouldn't be. I don't think anyone would feel safe flying on a plane without a pre-flight safety protocol that every pilot must follow. This is an example of a protocol for uh, ammunition, blank ammunition on, uh, on movie sets. My brother works in LA. And this is a really specific protocol that must be followed. And we all know that when that's not adhered to, really dangerous things can happen, including the death that was uh, sometime last year. And in our social lives too, as Kenny is recently very aware, congratulations. Um, we have set standards for things that we, that we want in society. An example, this is a marriage uh, license. There is a very specific set of things that must be done, that must be followed to get a marriage certificate. And what I wanna point out here, and I'll talk about this again and again, is that this is a core protocol. This doesn't necessarily tell you, you have to get married in a church or you have to get married in the park. This is the specific set of core things that must be followed, but then the rest of it can kind of be dictated per personal uh, preference. So ASAP does have a policy statement on protocols. They're pro protocol for standard operating protocols, which is a type of diagnostic protocol usually uh, started in triage. So per ASAP, um, it is gonna increase the uh, patient safety and, and, and patient satisfaction. Um, it's gonna reduce the overall time or the length of stay in the emergency department. It can uh, enhance patient comfort uh, and it, it improves the uh, institutional treatment for time specific uh, diagnoses. I want you all to think of a board like this, which we all know, we've all seen, where patients are waiting 10 plus hours to be seen at county. And I want you to think of what would happen if we had a standing order or diagnostic protocol in place for some key conditions. Chest pain is very controversial, but let's talk about one that I'll talk about later, like vaginal bleeding, which is often a patient that doesn't necessarily need to be seen right away and does wait. What if we had some things in place that got done for every patient with that diagnosis before we even had to see them? 
So they had blood tests done. Maybe they had some imaging done. Maybe they had an EKG, or maybe they had a, a urine pregnancy test that was already ordered. This is the type of, of standing order or diagnostic protocol and, and how it can function in institutions. And this is a specific study from 2016. It was not randomized. It was a, uh, oh no, sorry, this was a randomized control trial on a specific standing protocol, kind of showing that, that when you have standing protocols in place, it reduces the time from provider to disposition. And I wanna be clear about that, is that it's not reducing the time that the provider has to spend with the patient. It's reducing the overall time that they need to, because a lot of the things that we're waiting for have already been done blood tests, imaging, EKGs, like I'm talking about. And please notice that in under the standing orders on the left, the time is not zero for, for the time that providers spend with their patients. It's still 128 minutes in this study, significantly reduced from 154, but there's enough time to personalize care after that specific core central set of protocols is followed, adding on tests, adding on imaging, and it's not dictating if patients need to be admitted or, or disposition. That's part of that 128 minutes uh, that the provider is spending with the patient. Now I wanna go over just a few specific protocols that maybe you guys could start to see in, in practice here, maybe not. So one is a chest pain protocol, uh, contentious. I understand, I can see some eye rolls already in the, in the audience, but think about this particular protocol. So this is from a QI study, it's not published uh, in the, uh, peer review data, but it is an interesting QI study, and it included a triage chest pain protocol, a diagnostic standing order protocol, including these labs. And what I want to point out is that the troponin is a panel. So it's not just one, it's two. Um, it has EKGs, tele, IVs, uh, and, and imaging. And so when you think about what this could be potentially in practice is the patients that are waiting five or six hours with chest pain would have not a single troponin, but a delta troponin done before you see them, potentially reducing the time that they need uh, to have that repeat troponin if you don't feel that this patient particularly needs to be admitted. And the data is pretty good for this particular QI project. It's gonna decrease the time pretty significantly for all of the things uh, that, that flow metrics really care about. The door-to-door -door minute is reduced by an hour and a half. The door to EKG minute is reduced by five, and that may not seem like a lot, but when you think of the national benchmark of 10 minutes, that's actually quite a big decrease from 13 to nine. The labs are gonna get improved uh, and the door to imaging is improved too, which may not, we may not care about so much. I chose to include this because this is the only one I could find that specifically talked about patient satisfaction. And we don't really think a lot about that at county, but a lot of private institutions and, and many of the places that we will go after working here, this really matters. Patient satisfaction determines how you get reimbursed, what resources you can provide to patients in the community. And for these, the press gaining score increased from around 60 to around 90. It's a pretty significant increase. And I think we can all conceptualize why that might be the case. Patients are not waiting for a very long time they're getting personalized care up front. They're still seeing physicians. They're still having decisions made by physicians with care that's discussed with them, but they've had blood draws, they've had IVs placed, they've had chest x-rays done, potentially before seeing the physician, which would improve patient satisfaction. Let's move away from chest pain, because I understand. Let's talk about an infectious disease protocol that I think a lot of us would be okay with. It's febrile neutropenia. So this was a single set uh, study. It was a cohort study done in an academic emergency department. And it was a set of standing and treatment protocols for patients with febrile neutropenia, screened in by having fever and cancer, um, either at triage or within the last 24 hours of 100.4 or higher. This particular protocol included a set of blood, blood tests, including blood cultures, CBC. It included starting antibiotics and antipyretics but what I think we might enjoy about this protocol is that it Im immediately placed patients in a room. It immediately had a provider see the patient, uh, and it immediately up triaged the ESI, all part of the protocol, kind of combining this diagnostic and therapeutic protocols into one. And as we can see, it improved a lot of the things that we care about. I'm going to say that over and over. It increased the time to antibiotics. It increased the treatment room placement, which increased the time, or decreased, excuse me, the time to see the provider. 
This is where I think we might get on board with protocols, a core set of things that are done with an expedited evaluation by a physician and a set of things that we can agree upon is necessary for a patient of this kind. Antibiotics, a CBC, a blood culture, rooming and IV lines. Now we'll talk about a set of multiple protocols and for the sake of time, because I know that we are running out, I will uh, briefly go over it, but focus in on vaginal bleeding. So for the last three, vaginal bleeding during pregnancy, uh, upper and lower abdominal pain, it significantly reduced the length of stay, anywhere from 230 minutes to uh, 130 minutes. For pain and fever, it reduced the time to treatment of analgesia or antipyretics. And the middle two uh, were, not, were not sensitive, uh, or not, not uh, not, not good enough to, to find a significant difference. So again, I want to go back to that thought of vaginal bleeding in pregnancy and think about it in our population. Again, patients wait in the waiting room for 230 minutes at some points. And all of that time is before they're getting pregnancy tests, before they're getting blood work, before they're getting anything done. And in this particular protocol for vaginal bleeding in pregnancy, it included an RH factor, it included a CDC and included a beta HCG. So at the time that the ED physician saw the patient, these things were done already. They could have shared decision-making about what was next in terms of it was an ultrasound transabdominally or transvaginally to have a true informed decision about Rogam if the patient was RH status negative um, and uh, to kind of dictate the care moving forward. I wanna conclude with some trauma protocols uh, because I think that's actually pretty applicable to us as well. So this was a single retrospective study that showed a decrease in time for life-saving interventions. Um, and this was done pre and post the, in the initiation of a trauma protocol. A lot of these things we don't care about. Uh, the tetanus vaccinations, the uh, NG tubes, but some of these things we really do care about and are significantly different after protocolization. Transfusions that are begun in the ED, resuscitation with fluids for hypotensive patients, giving antibiotics, uh, and patient-centered giving analgesics uh, and, and placing, placing IV lines for, for care. And this is just the last thing that I wanna end on is that it can have a mortality benefit too. There is not great, and, and there's not a lot of data on this, but this was a single study that was pre and post test, um, so not the best methodology, but did show a decrease in mortality from 38% to 18% after the initiation of a protocol in trauma for traumatic brain injury. So in conclusion, I hope that I may have provided some data for you to see that protocols can improve the flow of an emergency department, can reduce the time to treatments for patients, uh, for, for antibiotics, for analgesics, for antipyretics, and can improve patient satisfaction, uh, which can have a real impact in the way that we give care. So just think about this as you listen to the rest of the arguments from Kenny. Protocols can indeed improve in department flow, can improve the time to treatment, can really make our jobs a little bit easier and more efficient and can improve patient satisfaction. Thank you guys. Yeah. Thank you, Eli. Um, I'm Kenny, uh, EMI4. So uh, this is against protocolization. Um, so I'm not necessarily gonna talk about fully against it. I'm just gonna talk about the reasons why it has, or just talk about the negative effects that it has had. Um, so Eli mentioned that protocols, very defined set of instructions for a very defined reason. Uh, the, the problem is when we get into over protocolization of every little thing, uh, and that's where negative consequences happen. But we'll also say that in practice, a lot of people don't actually adhere to the definitions of a protocol. Uh, case in point, in, in our institutions, uh, and I'm sure elsewhere too as well, uh, it gets confusing for the providers, for nursing, for even patients, uh, where we cross lines between guidelines, protocols, uh, 
even our protocols seem to be workflows instead of protocols or our odds protocols are more exclusion inclusion criteria rather than protocols. Um, so I just had a, a make-believe scenario, but I'll run through it quickly. Uh, imagine triage notes says 10 out of 10 pain. This is what you're expecting. And this is what you get, right? We've all run into this scenario before. Uh, patient's talking to you. You explain 10 out of 10 pain as a chainsaw literally going through their body. And they still say 10 out of 10. You treat them appropriately. Uh, are you supposed to escalate this? Are you not supposed to escalate this? And it's still 10 out of 10 pain. Now, if you had a pain protocol, which many EDs do have, uh, they're gonna dictate what meds you use, the frequency, how often you should check, documentation, uh, and possibly dispo. So do you do an admission for someone like this? Do you do PCA pump? Uh, do you do title and discharge? Are you worried about their patient satisfaction score uh, after they leave? Are you worried about documentation and you're gonna be reprimanded for not treating their pain appropriately, uh, given that her chart or whoever's chart is just plastered with 10 out of 10 pain, even though you try to argue against it. So this has even larger implications, uh, especially now that we're in the opioid epidemic, um, there's social issues with this too. So my slides are um, organized a little differently where I just focus on the uh, people and parties involved. So patient, physician, and ED, healthcare system. Uh, this slide was definitely, uh, it seemed a little tough to put together and to look up papers. Um, there seems to be a lot of anecdotal evidence. Um, there's not a lot of papers poo-pooing uh, protocols, especially because they're usually put out by admins. You don't really want to bite the hand that feeds you. Uh, and then a lot of these poor performing protocols aren't really published. So that's just the caveat, not an excuse. Um, so patients, uh, we ultimately want to, you know, improve their, their symptoms or uh, improve their medical outcomes. Uh, we don't want to uh, cause harm. So just focus on that, do no harm. So I think we'll go over this first example, which is a uh, percolized treatment of something that's very, it's, it's a very large topic like sepsis. Uh, <laughs> uh, so this seems to be that the poster child of productization. So this stemmed from a, a study in uh, New England Journal of Medicine in 2001. And from there, uh, essentially it, it stated that um, early goal-directed therapies are gonna be beneficial for patients. From there, you have the surviving sepsis protocol uh, and that's gone through several iterations and you're down to a one hour bundle where you're providing uh, meds, drawing labs, providing fluids, uh, a set amount uh, and pressors if needed. So there's a lot of evidence refuting this, uh, three that you see above here, there's no difference in all cause, all cause mortality. Um, but there are some studies now that obviously are going to show that there's harm associated with interventions like fluid resuscitation. Uh, so again, this is an example of a disease process, sepsis, that's very, it's a, a very broad topic, has a very uh, broad population, uh, essentially anybody can get it. Uh, and then patients themselves have different physiologic reserves, comorbidities, physiology, and they respond to therapies differently. So you're trying to attempt to uh, apply these oversimplistic requirements and treatment strategies, thinking it's gonna help everyone. So the other side of it, um, or another type of protocols is diagnostic pathways. Uh, if a certain patient meets criteria, whether subjective or objective, they're just shuttled into this uh, set of uh, definitive instructions. You can have this built into the EMR, you can have staff activated, uh, so a lot of these are built on clinical decision rules like heart pathway or wells. Uh, and these clin clinical decision rules themselves are supposed to help clinicians decide on what to do. They're not supposed to be, you should do this, but often they are codified in these pathways. Uh, some of these are based on clinical practice guidelines. And these are usually set out from uh, professional medical organizations like ASAP and hospitals or hospital systems will use these guidelines as, hey, you should be doing this. 
So there's ne negative con consequences with this. Uh, you get unnecessary testing, you get downstream effects of empiric antibiotics given, it might lead to drug resistance and overuse, uh, increased imaging, radiation exposure, and bottlenecks in your imaging time. Uh, you get extra tests uh, where you can find uh, incidental findings causing maybe prolonged hospital stay uh, and harm to the patients. Uh, and, and all these increase uh, costs and increase ED length of stay. Now there's also harm with just being in a hospital. Uh, it's up to 400,000 deaths a year that are associated with preventable adverse events in the hospital. Now, uh, whether protocols cause this or not, but uh, there's no study obviously, but just being in a hospital increases your risk for badness. Uh, and then this paper down here just shows uh, protocolized laboratory screening. You might recognize uh, some of the authors, but it showed it, uh, well, it looked into a vulnerable population for psychiatric patients and whether you need to do uh, routine testing or not in order to transfer or admit them to the CPAP. Uh, and basically showed that 80% of all ED visits with an eventual psych admission had medical tests. Uh, the ASAP policy currently is do not order lab tests on acute psychiatric symptoms, use medical history, previous psych diagnoses and physical exam to guide testing. Now, they, this is a small study. They had three retrospective studies that they looked at, um, but they found that only up to 0.4% of uh, abnormal test results resulted in a change in patient disposition. It seems pretty low. Uh, at the same time, psych patients going to CPAP, they have a longer wait time to ED, uh, which again, adds to overcrowding. Now, again, we're, we're adding extra tests, we're adding extra imaging. Uh, there's a, a systematic review from JAMA that shows that clinicians tend to overestimate the harms and, uh, sorry, overestimate the benefits and underestimate the harms of interventions. And this includes antibiotics, uh, surgical procedures, anticoagulation, uh, and then medical imaging. Uh, so I just showed, uh, this is just uh, a table of CT scans. Uh, the light green is basically doctors underestimating the harm and the dark green is uh, overestimating the harm. You can see that generally uh, we tend to underestimate, underestimate the harms. So think about this when we call stroke codes or when they're called for us and they have no stroke symptoms, are we causing them harm by not canceling them or uh, having the, the protocol itself. And then uh, in terms of satisfaction scores, there's a study that uh, looked at 52,000 patients and they found that increased patient satisfaction, yes, it was associated with lower ER use, but it's also associated with higher inpatient use, uh, greater healthcare expenditures, uh, greater healthcare expenditures on prescription drugs. And the kicker here is that it actually has greater mortality risk compared to patients that were least satisfied. Uh, they didn't have a definitive answer to why this happened. They were suggesting that maybe uh, if, you, if you're admitted or if you use higher intensity, uh, if you're, you're admitted to a higher intensity level of care, that you're gonna use more discretionary health services, increasing the uh, risk of adverse events. But in the end, we're not really sure uh, what feeds into those patient satisfaction scores, what drives them and also the health implications of it. So I don't think this is a, a basis for uh, using protocols. Uh, now physicians. So one of the main, te main tenets of medical ethics is autonomy. Uh, we give our patients autonomy to do what they think is in their best interest after we talk to them about the risk benefits alternatives. Now they didn't go to medical school, they didn't read papers, they didn't look at the studies, uh, but we did. Now should they be getting this autonomy and we don't, even though we've gone through all this training and whatnot, do we know what's best for our patients? And a lot of us would like to say, yes, we do. Uh, and this opens a, a bigger door into whether the emergency medicine industry or the healthcare industry should be using protocolized medicine for mid-level providers instead of us, where we have the role of uh, using our gestalt and whatnot based on all our training. Uh, we talked about burnout uh, with all the wellness lectures earlier. So again, uh, bureaucratic tasks, loss of autonomy, these are the main factors of burnout. 
And we just get a sense of purpose from helping people out and using our uh, noggins to, to do that. So uh, education is a, a big, uh, I guess, uh, factor into a lot of the things I talk to for why they don't want protocols. Uh, there's a piece written in the American Journal of Medicine from a Dr. Kuna, which is an ID doctor who described a master clinician and a master clinician must demonstrate the process of diagnostic reasoning and clinical problem solving. Basically, uh, they have to go through training and experiences, uh, failures, and then they learn mm -hmm. from that. And then at the end, you're going to be able to uh, assess uh, diagnostic weights to all the clinical findings that you have. And this way, you can come up with a differential. Now, without this, you're essentially just following uh, A to B to C and just following a, a, a set uh, pathway to get to the diagnosis. Uh, and in his paper or article, he has a proverb that kind of just talks about this and kind of summarizes it where he says, uh, quote, I, put in, I pointed out the stars to you and all you saw was the tip of my finger. So instead of coming up with your own thought processes and, and the end point to that, you're just following the process and you can't come to the conclusion. You just see the tip of the finger. Um, and just to reiterate how clinical decisions uh, should be made on experience, we all know the PERC rule uh, and Wells criteria that they're supposed to be objectifying uh, medicine, but you can see that PERC should only be applied well, we deem that the pretest probably is less than 50%. Wells has two components where they have clinical signs and symptoms that we deem are relevant. Um, so again, this goes back to the diagnostic weight where we're, we're actually using our noggin to think about these things. Uh, and then another point is uh, cognitive unloading. So to go with the stroke codes and trauma codes, uh, a lot of these are called and in essence, you're following a pathway uh, to whatever endpoint it is. Now, yes, they, they may find certain issues in pathology, um, but oftentimes we have this where, you know, a nurse or somebody will say, well, I didn't want to miss anything, even though there's no, no neuro finding. Um, a lot of times uh, you just talk to neuro residents or stroke team, They'll just let this go on and, and, and we'll get the CT scan expense of the patient. Um, so essentially this is something that we, we actually aren't actively thinking about um, and just doing a process. Uh, and this can lead to anchoring as well. I think somebody mentioned that a STEMI was, was called in as a notification and that's being a stroke. Uh, and then there's a bunch of studies that kind of gauge uh, and compare physical uh, physician judgment versus uh, clinical decision aids. Again, this isn't comparing physician judgment and gestalt with protocols per se, but because protocols, a lot of them are based on clinical decision tools, uh, kind of made this conclusion or jumped to this. Uh, uh, yeah, you get, you get what I mean. Um, but essentially uh, all three found that uh, Clinical judgment, gestalt, uh, didn't fare worse than clinical decision aids or tools. Uh, in some cases, in a lot of cases, clinical uh, gestalt was actually better. Um, and that's better. And just going to the ED on uh, the healthcare system. Uh, so there's a paper in, in a GI journal uh, that mentioned clinical practice guidelines. Like I mentioned, ASEP has, has them. A lot of other uh, medical uh, professional organizations have them. They pointed out uh, a few major problems with them. Uh, one, they're, they're mainly based on low quality data. Two, uh, there's not a lot of uh, literature even out there to develop uh, uh, evidence-based guidelines on them. Three, uh, most of the guidelines are uh, meant for a textbook patient, not individualized patient. And four, guidelines are often developed about the consideration of uh, what's acceptable patients, physicians, and the healthcare system. Uh, and they also mentioned a Harvard School of Public Health study, which showed that a lot of plaintiff lawyers at least 
half of them had used uh, clinical practice guidelines uh, in one of the cases that they've had before uh, in the context that uh, they are saying clinical practice guidelines uh, are the standard of care. Now, if you don't do them, they're essentially gonna sue you for negligence. Uh, so sure, this is for clinical practice guidelines uh, is it going to happen for protocols? Well, it has happened for protocols before. And I found this uh, article from this uh, medical information site that cited two ED malpractice lawsuits in Albany for chest pain. Initial troponins were negative. EKGs were negative. They both reported physical activity that might have caused muscle strain. They both improved uh, in their pain level while in the ED. There's no pain at discharge. They were both referred to cardiologists and were instructed to return to the ED if pain returned or worsened. They both returned to the ED in cardiac arrest. Uh, they did fine afterwards. They both uh, did not, they both mentioned that they received excellent care, but there was, in both cases, the, the physicians were still sued. Uh, under the, uh, under the uh, pretext that, I mean, under the assumption that they had, uh, practice neg negligence, or they're accused of negligence because they didn't follow their hospital's chest pain protocol. Uh, and then the, the last bit is just how protocols can be really resource intensive. Uh, and I keep on going back to this uh, seps surviving sepsis campaign, um, just as the poster child, but remember it doesn't have to be a large prominent protocol that uses up your resources. It could be just a lot of smaller ones. Uh, so the main regulatory reporting agency for surviving sepsis is CMS, the Center of Medicare and Medicaid Services. And they came up with this uh, protocol in 2015 called SEP1. SEP uh, there's one study that showed for, even for a single patient, you have to report at least up to five hemodynamic interventions, as many as 141 tasks. It takes as long as three hours to do. Uh, for both physicians and nursing. Any deviation from this pathway, you have to write down your justifications. That's just one of these organizations that requires reporting. Uh, there's a the Department of Health and all these other ones that are uh, listed here, Joint Commission, whatnot. Uh, so essentially, uh, it, it just seems like an over metrification of the healthcare system. You're competing from uh, and stealing time away from important clinical care time. Uh, and it seems like a top-down approach where you're telling somebody to do something uh, which, should, which will guide clinical care rather than the other way around. Uh, so this is actually linked to reimbursements. Um, so essentially, if you don't comply with the reporting, uh, you either get rewarded for actually complying or you get penalized for not complying. It almost has this fee for service feel where you're not really caring about the outcomes. Uh, it can, uh, can affect your reaccreditation with joint commission uh, and essentially you can affect your reputation as a hospital. Uh, and obviously there's extra dollars uh, that you spend for uh, the administrative cost for compliance. Uh, this paper down here is actually from a, a sociology major or a PhD um, who looked into a, an unnamed New York City hospital and their journey through uh, implementing their sepsis protocols. And essentially they, they spent multiple committee times, multiple uh, uh, EMR upgrades. Uh, they went through um, mergers with a larger hospital system that really focused on just reporting. And uh, in the end, the administrators still said, you guys are not improving uh, in sepsis, while the doctors were quoted saying, with the exception of mortality, because their mortality uh, rates had gone down, even though they were not complying with metric, the sepsis metrics of com uh, compliance. Uh, so this in closing, uh, this is a really good quote that I found. Uh, good doctors use both clinical expertise and the best available external evidence, and neither alone is 
enough without clinical expertise, practice risks become tyrannized uh, by evidence. Uh, for even excellent external evidence may be inapplicable to or inappropriate to an individual patient, evidence-based medicine is not cookbook medicine. Thank you.